guest this time is Ron Broglio, who teaches at Georgia Institute of Technology. Got it wrong the first time, Ron. Okay. Uh, Ron's special interest is in the idea of animality, and Ron, uh, in thinking about this and trying to think of approach for it, I started thinking about the question of the animal, the question of the human, and the question of the machine, which all sorts of merged together into this huge ball of energy and questions. And uh, I came across this John Berger quote, who, uh, in speaking of the Cartesian break or splitting off of the animal and the human and the soulful and the soulless, and of course we know the animal has no soul, has this to say. It's fairly long, but it will kind of give us a departure point, maybe. And it goes like this. The consequences of Descartes' break followed only slowly. A century later, the great zoologist Buffon, although accepting and using the model of the machine in order to classify animals and their capacities, nevertheless displays a tenderness towards animals which temporarily reinstates them as companions, a place we're still at today, I would add. This tenderness is half envious. What man has to do in order to transcend the animal, to transcend the mechanical within himself, and what his unique, unique spirituality leads to is often anguish. And so, by comparison, and despite the model of the machine, the animal seems to enjoy to him a kind of innocence. The animal has been emptied of experience and secrets, and this new invented innocence begins to provoke in man a kind of nostalgia. For the first time, animals are placed in a receding past. So uh, the question I would ask you is the new discourse on animality, which we see in theoretical circles everywhere, more signs of that recession of the animal, or is it a sign of a new approach to the question of the animal, which is also, of course, the question of the human, and perhaps also the question of the secret, which is alluded to in the Berger quote. Mm. You know, this is interesting. Um, this resurgence of the animal and its persistence as a question. Perhaps one of the the reason I like the idea of animality is that in animal studies, a lot of it has worked on the history of animals in human culture mm -hmm. and the role that animals have played to help us in founding the nation in the mm -hmm. recent Definitely. book in the U.S. and. Uh, or uh, how they've helped us in issues of domestication, and mm -hmm. there's the companion species. And also the idea of animals fitting into psychological therapeutic modes in relation to humans, which has now right. come out uh, recently. Right, right. And, and oedipalization of the animal through pets, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what's interesting about this uh, quotation and, and what is interesting about animality, and I think this cuts several ways, one is the idea that we too are animal, and so mm -hmm. this nostalgia for the animal is part of a concern over our own split, our own divide, mm -hmm. and having to uh, slough off this body uh, that has to uh, find its uh, its uh, other, its companion with these animals. Uh, we want to reach sort of a higher, higher plateaus in this chain of being. And then uh, in addition to that split is this question of the world of the animal or the soulless animal. Um, I'm quite fond of Heidegger's notion mm -hmm. in Fundamentals and Metaphysics um, where he says that the rock is worldless, the animal is poor in world, and mm -hmm. humans are, are worlding, right? They have mm -hmm. a world creating. And so this porn world, and many pe people, including Agamben, as you know, and, and, and Derrida have spent quite a bit of time on this, um, this porn world is interesting because it suggests that there is something just on this other side, but it's unrepresentable and unnameable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's this suggestivity of that that... Uh, that lingers in that quotation. So you think that some of the contemporary discourse of the animal is inextricably tied to the discourse of the post-human mm -hmm. that we're also seeing now to some degree. Uh, the mm -hmm. Transcendence of the human, the transcendence of the animal, or the, the, the becoming of the animal of the human. I don't know. We're in a very yeah. complicated, confusing era now about what uh, our expectations are as regard the other living species on the planet in relation to us. Yeah, I think that's, you know, you've You've intuited uh, really the heart of a problem. Uh, Jonathan Curry, uh, who did uh, edited Zoontology mm -hmm. and right. his Animal Rights, mm -hmm. just came out. 
uh, is starting a new series, um, I believe with Michigan Press, but not positive, which uh, is on the post-human. And he really wants, I uh, just got, uh, got off the plane from Amsterdam, we were talking about this, and he really wants to include a variety of uh, people writing on animals mm -hmm. in this series of the post-human. Mm -hmm. So he wants to position the animal as the problem of uh, thinking outside of outside of the hu of humanism, mm -hmm. and, you know, ever since Foucault, right? It's not just God is dead; Foucault says man is dead. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the humanist subject is dead, and uh, and that brings us to Derrida and says, you know, what comes after the subject, mm -hmm. and um, and on eating well. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. I mean, that's very, and it's very problematic in regard to animals because eating well. Uh, is a carnophallic, I say carnophallo lococentric, I guess, <laughs> as Derrida would put it, uh, problematic because many people eat animals. And that's uh, not to say that that's a good or a bad thing, but it's simply that animals have become fast food in a fast thinking sort of environment. And as we know, philosophical, theoretical thought really is about slow digestion, slow ingestion, and slow thinking. So it's, you know, the animal even fits in to the very basic processes of our life and how we uh, would we be able to do without the animal in that regard if there were certain ethical constraints on consumption of, of animals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, so there's, there's uh, this is, you know, that's, uh, before we jump into that issue, um, there's, uh, several other things going on as well, and I'm reminded of uh, Nietzsche's semi-famous, at least, quote, one of his many famous quotes from uh, the prologue to Zarathustra, which says uh, that man uh, needs to become more like cattle. Mm. He, he needs to learn how to read um, by grazing. Mm -hmm. and, for, mm -hmm. and and ruminating mm -hmm. and and it's this ability to chew and ruminate and slow digestion mm -hmm. uh, that is antithetical to uh, the contemporary demand uh, capitalist technological demand for the new mm -hmm. and and the syllable um, and that gets into issues of representation and I think that the real challenge for me in animals is the issue of representability the animal as uh, we want to colonize it through representation, uh, which would include digestion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yet it's where are the lines of flight for the animal being and the animal that therefore I am. Mm -hmm. In other words, we eat ourselves as well in mm -hmm. eating the animal. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, Heide, I mean, uh, Agamben has this quote that goes... Insofar as the animal knows neither beings nor non-beings, neither open nor closed, it is outside of being. It is outside in an exteriority more external than any open, and inside in an intimacy more internal than any closedness. I take that to be sort of extimacy that Lacan talks about, which is a kind of an uncanniness, cohabiting of several spheres. Anyway, to let the animal be would then mean to let it be outside of being. So that would be the case for an, for humans also as a kind of an animal. Let's follow up on the Heidegger quote. That is, to let or the the Nietzsche quote rather to uh, let humans be animals that graze, which brings in the whole post structuralist um, leotardian problematic of the inhuman. That is, at the base of the human is the inhuman. It's not the human. Uh, but I'm wondering if there is not an ethical slippery slope there, um, since with the rise of cloning and biological, techno-biological techniques, um, the idea of subjectivity begins to evaporate a little bit. If you think in terms of this Agamben quote, to let it be outside of being, which, where would that be exactly? Where would, where would the individual exist in that? Where would subjectivity exist in that? And in fact, from post-structuralist point of view, it would not be because subjectivity is a very problematic aspect of post-structuralist thought, I think. Um, so in, if, if we become more like animal, does that mean that we become more like standing reserve that Heidegger talked about? So when then we, we enter more of a kind of a national socialist kind of problematic <laughs> in terms of purity and hybridization and all kinds of uh, very problematic issues that people sort of address now with issues of immigration and national porosity of borders and things like that.
You know, it's it's you've you've hit upon uh, one of my favorite quotes in the Gombins, the mm. Open. Really, mm. I just reviewed that for Parallax. Actually. Oh yeah, mm. and they have a great series. It was part of a um, uh, a series of essays on the animal that mm -hmm. just came out. So mm -hmm. it's a very sort of mm. timely issue. Mm. Um, and uh, I would recommend anyone who wants to do work on the animal to look at the Parallax series. But that Agamben quote um, hits to really the issues of representation and uh, representability contra Heidegger. Now, remember that Heidegger's project is to bring beings into the open, um, fa grounded by being, which is the sort of the the grounding question. Now, if these beings are in the open, who is doing this? Um, humans are the shepherd of being. Mm. And so our role for Heidegger is to, is to bring these things in, together and shepherd mm -hmm. them. And there's a sort of, there's an ethical responsibility, but it's always the sense that the humans have uh, either the pen in hand or the shepherd staff in hand. Mm -hmm. That is, they can prod things, beings along. What we forget, and what I'm much more fond of, is Nietzsche's satire from uh, um, from The Birth of Tragedy, in which uh, Nietzsche says, uh, the friend of Dionysus, and here the, mm -hmm. the, the play of illusion and problems of representation, the friend of Dionysus is, is the satyr, and today all we have is the tricked-up shepherd. Mm -hmm. now, <laughs> And the satyr is aware, highly aware, of course, of his divided nature mm -hmm. and also the divided nature of, of uh, Dionysus, who will be rent apart, mm -hmm. literally divided, torn apart. Mm -hmm. and, and in these festivities, the sort of real uh, issue of tearing open and eating. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, which is consuming understanding, right? mm -hmm. taking in. And... So for Gomben, uh to have these beings outside of the open is a real concern, uh, a real issue of allowing beings to be, as, as, as uh, Gomben is saying here, allowing beings to be outside of shepherding, which would mean allowing our being out to be outside of shepherding. Remember that Gomben in Homo Soccer, which he wrote, mm -hmm. of course, just before mm -hmm. the open, um, and Homo Sacra is, is very concerned with our animal life, that is, a bare living. Right. And increasingly, what's in, in bio, the biopower, the issue of biopower, mm -hmm. is the agriculture today with genetic modification uh, of, of, of plants and now animals, is all of, all of agriculture is becoming uh, state policed, which includes, of course, fast food, fast exactly. food nation, mm -hmm. our bodies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which raises the question which was alluded to uh, in the quote from Berger where he talks about, let's see, how does he put it, uh, the animal has been emptied of experience and secrets. And definitely it seems to me like Agamben wants to reclaim some aspect mm -hmm. of the secret, of the mystery, which, of course, from modernity's point of view and a certain radical modernity is problematic since, as we know, the history of modernity has been about the uh, attaining transparency in all aspects, uh, attaining a kind of a, uh, an operability all the way down to the bottom. Mm. So um, I, I guess I, I see to some degree resistance coming from some ideas of secrecy and from mystery, but also it's still very suspicious to people. Um, but if, if, if the inside is not somehow a secret, then it's hard to see how one can maintain certain ideas about the autonomy of the individual or the autonomy of bare life uh, as an oppositional strategy to the state, which is where I think Agamemnon is coming with, from some, to some degree, with the bare life uh, yeah. business. Uh, yeah, so. no, I think that's absolutely right. It's and and again, it comes around this question of of consumption and state consumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, is there a space? where we can imagine uh, resistance. At, can we imagine exactly. the animal revolution? Mm -hmm, exactly. And what is our role within that animal mm -hmm. revolution? I mean, mm -hmm. that sort of most mm -hmm. radical edge. And uh, there are a lot of uh, artists as well as uh, philosophers who are, I think, working, mm -hmm. you know, certainly political activists, but also artists and philosophers working at that. Well, it could be that um, just kind of 
uh, some speculative blissed out moment here that the human shepherding, if you want to put it, go back to the Heideggerian thing, is to consume all the animals, to eviscerate ourselves into the animal again, sort of like the Boschian, Hieronymus Bosch's uh, uh, triptych where animals and humans have become hybridized completely so that you have humans with bird heads, so that the, the moment of speculative energy in a Hegelian sense would be where humans have eaten everything and at the same time then regurgitate ourselves as these complex hybrid creatures that include the animal in themselves after we have gone through this whole digestion process, which is not a pleasant thought, I agree, but if you look at the history of the world in the West, that seems to be what we're about, is this massive world-eating project. Right, and remember, and th I, again, you know, to return to that Agamben, it is uh, he opens with this uh, issue of the the supper at the end of Fascinating. days, right? right? Yeah. The, 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 beautiful the, imagery, you know, mm -hmm. really. And then also a few chapters later, issues of defecation, mm -hmm. what happens to mm -hmm. our shit, mm -hmm. and. All, all of those revolve around the issues of culture mm -hmm. and the end of times, the end of history is the end of culture. And so are humans willing to let go of culture? Mm -hmm. and, and are we willing to let go of representation and consumption uh, that is uh, fast food? Mm -hmm. um, are, are we willing to graze? Mm. Um, which would seem to be problematic now, given uh, you know our technological imperative to uh, colonize uh, everything. But again, that would that would be an endpoint, right, of history. That is, the grazing would be at some undeterminate future point at the end of right. You know, I history. think what, it's interesting. What, one of the uh, tricky things in talking about the animal is to not have this nostalgia, right? To be able to sort of I was thinking right. of your quote again and. It's to not have a nostalgia of, gee, wouldn't it be wonderful to be animal, mm -hmm. to be this thing that we've lost in the sort of Garden mm -hmm. of Eden, but to um, imagine another space that is this animal, this becoming. This is where I think the Deleuze is right, that, mm -hmm. that we're not becoming any specific, we are not being towards a specific animal. But it's always this continual becoming. It's always a sort of betweenness mm -hmm. that we're, we're captured within that betweenness, and it's that it's that betweenness that allows us opportunities against the state mm -hmm. apparatus, which mm -hmm. would capture us. That you know gives us right. the social security numbers, sure. the addresses that that limits the borders, that cuts off mm -hmm. uh, issues of immigration, etc. Is uh, all those are issues of crossing, crossing over, and, and uh, but I wonder if that would mean that then the specificity of the singularity of any particular animal, since we don't see them as having personalities anyway, mm -hmm. becomes a moot point for us. That is, we now, uh, speaking of grazing, we now grow cattle in huge pens that you can see from outer space, these huge black spots from their feces, you know, and where they're being raised. Um, so if that means the singularity of the animal then becomes transformed into basically a kind of a, a, a sterilized, domesticated companion species, a familiar to us, as they say in, in terms of witchery, much like the avatars that we have now in the computer, so that the animal becomes really kind of like an avatar, becomes a, uh, it becomes a non-naturalized sort of uh, entity. I mean, animals now, they're, you know, we sterilize them, we keep them with us, we feed them artificial food. They're really artificial constructs. Uh, they don't, they're not around their kind anymore. They don't react, uh, you know, uh, like they would out in the wild. So, and, you know, that's one kind of end, is to naturalize them to be our own image, you know, except looking like an animal. But they're really like us. They're really aspects of our psychologies, our techniques, and our technologies. So, so are, you, are you thinking that the survival of the animal may mean the transformation of the animal into um, some sort of non-natural species in order to survive, and then it's kind of like, what's the point? You know, let's right. just eat them and be done with it. Yeah, you know, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Things. I mean, it's really a timely question, given you know Mal Michael Pollan's book, *The Omnivore's mm -hmm. Dilemma*, mm -hmm. right? And and so much of the technologized animal mm -hmm. um, and uh, genetic experiments to really bolster the animal for human consumption mm -hmm. so that we've modified species at the very genetic levels right there. Mm -hmm. And there's now 
there's no natural end. I mean, I got interested in this question because I'm coming from British Romantic, the picturesque and landscape tradition. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned at how animals were treated in that tradition. Often they weren't. If nature was talked about by Wordsworth, it was you know, the clouds and the daffodils. Mm -hmm. But there were no eyes of the other looking out at us, mm -hmm. which would give nature a certain agency and poignantness. Mm -hmm. And now what's interesting is while we are trying to domesticate all of these various species. And granted, you know, animals are going to evolve, evolve and their genetic traits will evolve one way or another. Once it's they're left, right. <laughs> after we've extinguished right. them. <laughs> but we've, 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 we've moved the genetic traits in a way that is purely for human consumption. That exactly. is, larger, larger breasts for chickens, uh, tastier parts of uh, for the beef that is the, um, the around the 13th rib where mm. the, where we sort of test for meat tenderness and marketability of of particular cattle so we've really modified for human consumption species already in in a, a eugenics fashion mm -hmm. um, but what might be interesting is to imagine where there is a space for them to evolve otherwise. And that is often the non-domesticated species. That is, um, we're concerned now with, uh, with bird flu, right? Mm -hmm. We're concerned with uh, a variety of bacterial agents, et cetera, right. things that can attack us, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. We were talking earlier about the difference between endoskeletons and exoskeletons. Uh, the skeleton inside the body being sort of a meat rack to hang things off of, which we call the animal, mm -hmm. and which we're comfortable with, but the exoskeleton being a container for this sort of uh, uncanny insectoid kind of creature that just multiply out there, you know, that we do our best to kind of stomp out. So, But insects are animals too, right? I mean, right. we think of, right? I mean, it's... Well, I mean, here we are at, at uh, the question of multitude, right? The Hart and Nett Gray mm -hmm. book, which mm -hmm. is highly political mm -hmm. and um, something that Eugene Thacker is now working on, which is also very much along those lines. Um, we return to the is issue of representation. In Heidegger, it's Gestell, which is in framing mm -hmm. and technological in framing as we bring these animals in. The frame the gestell as a frame or skeleton is in some ways that which holds the meat. Mm -hmm. And so what you've really wonderfully done is turn that around mm -hmm. and said, well, instead of this endoskeleton, uh, exo endoskeleton, what about an exoskeleton? What about these other creatures? And um, what's wonderful about this is that we begin to think of animals in terms of swarms, in terms of multiplicities. Mm -hmm. And then we begin to think of the human animal even in terms of swarm, mm -hmm. multiplicity, mob, mm -hmm. and its capabilities, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the very bare life of the, of, of the mob, of the multitude, that the state is trying to take care of and control through agriculture. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is that thing which takes the animal domestic and brings it from the wild into civilization, but keeps it out of the field at a safe distance, mm -hmm. right? We don't let them in our home but we, we sort of keep them at an interesting distance from us. And so that's um, really this issue of distance, proximity, mm -hmm. drawing near to things, and our relation to that within our own idea of mob or multiplicity. And, I, you know, I would say even for um, myself, the idea of swarm and bear life, it begins to seem kind of ominous and uh, uh, uncomfortable. I was at the uh, screen on the green last night. You know, there are like hundreds, if not thousands, of the people there, and you begin to get this very claustrophobic, sort of ant-like feeling. You know, you, you feel yourself being sort of simultaneously your subjectivity drained away into the mob, and at the same time, a part of you becomes sort of abhorrent about that whole aspect. Um, so the insect world, I think we we can come to terms a little bit better with the so-called animal world as opposed to the insect world, even though the terms we're using, they're both part of the animal world. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the insect world has this uncanny ability to, to creep into our life in crevices and cracks. Uh, like the fly, for example. You've just written uh, a prologue for a book on the fly, right? right, uh, right can you tell right, us right, right. a little bit about your work with that? Yeah, it's interesting. This is a group, um, uh, Brindis Neverdotter, um, and Mark Wilson, 
uh, who are in the UK and in Iceland, and this uh, is an art piece that just opened up mm. uh, a week or so ago in uh, Reykjavik. And the project is called A Fly in My Soup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And here, of course, uh, you know, the fly, uh, it, it turns the tables on that, doesn't it? You know, the, the mm -hmm. joke is, um, well, the fly is doing its thing. The backstroke. It's happy. <laughs> the backstroke. <laughs> Whereas, the my soup? Where, and so it's not my soup. It's now the fly soup, right. which is happily doing its thing. And so mm -hmm. in that project, what they're doing is uh, to go into uh, – various homes in Reykjavik and take pictures of where the animal dwells, mm -hmm. right? where, where, where it resides. And, of course, it's not the beautiful facades of the homes they're taking. It's not the you know, nice mantle and fireplace. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, they're taking pictures without the animal in it. Mm -hmm. Just of where it dwells, in the corner of the room, mm -hmm. in a washroom, in a, in a small sort of um, closet area. And so it turns the center of space. All of a sudden, there's this other dwelling within our dwelling. Mm, scary. That's right. the uncanny. That's, part of the, that's the extimacy right. of the uncanny, right? right? That Venn diagram of the interior and the exterior right. overlapping. And then right. where is that thing that they overlap? What is that all about? That's where the fly resides, right? right? Or, the, or the cockroach? Or, right, mm -hmm. right. And even our own so-called domesticated animals mm -hmm. and companion species, mm -hmm. you know, the dogs, the cats, et mm -hmm. cetera, that they've taken pictures of their, their dwelling space. And so in A Fly in My Soup, what they've really done is turn that around and said, no, maybe we're inhabiting their space. Mm. It's a very, uh, for me, and I wrote a bit about their work in, in their exhibition catalog, is it's a very Uxco moment mm -hmm. to realize that an Uxco uh, is a, a sort of a zoologist, 1920s, um, was uh, concerned with in, in, uh, in a little essay, A Stroll Through the World of Animals and Men, it says, uh, imagine a stroll on a nice summer day, sort mm -hmm. of like today, perhaps mm -hmm. in Atlanta, maybe not so hot. <laughs> um, and as we stroll through, we enter, we see these creatures and we enter into their world, their umwelt. Mm -hmm. And it's a bubble that surrounds us. And as we enter it, all of a sudden the world is distorted and there are other perceptual apparatus and we see the world differently. And so the... Uh, the Fly in My Soup uh, is an invitation to imagine this other bubble, this other world that, as you said in this Venn diagram, overlaps our own. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that we inhabit through our, our satire nature, mm -hmm. right, our dual mm -hmm. nature as humans. And really, it's a very necessary uh, project. It's almost like a phenomenological project concerning the animal. Of course, we cannot inhabit fully that animal world, but through certain ways of trying to reconceive the animal perception, we can get some idea of the different ratios, which is, to me, strikes me as a very important project given the leveling impact of most of modernity's quest uh, for transparency and levelness and having everything accessible. It could be that some things should be less accessible, maybe. I don't know. That's almost... I feel heretical even saying <laughs> that, you know. Um, but um, And there's an ethical component to that, perhaps, yeah. also. Uh, I don't know. Do you think that some things should be off limits in our explorations of the relation of um, humans, animals, and the mechanical? Um, I mean, cloning. Mm. Uh, right. I mean, or is there is there no moment at which right. the ethical comes into play in science's march into the into the future? Right. Well, um, this is an issue that's brought up in a variety of ways in, in the fly in my soup. Remember, the animal's never pictured. Mm -hmm. It's simply their dwelling space. So we're left to question and to really enter into that space. If it's pictured, it becomes simply portraiture again. Mm -hmm. It becomes the anthropocentric uh, mm -hmm. moment of, or the shooting of the animal through the photograph or right. through the gun, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why it's a suggestive, as you said, phenomenological issue. Now, to move to uh, the issue of genetics uh, and, and, and cloning and genetic modification, and even... Just basic breeding. Mm -hmm. I mean, basic well, breeding right. is, exactly. in fact, genetically modifying the animal. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing it for thousands of years and refined it over the last 200. But um, the concern is not simply, it's certainly scientific, but even in the art world, right? And mm -hmm. we have um, uh, 
uh, the the growing glowing green bunny, right? Mm. Eduardo uh, Cax, right, right? Exactly, Cax work, which and and people aren't sure where to go with that. Mm -hmm. Is that an invitation to explore that in mm -hmm. terms of art, mm -hmm. or is it um, a a yield sign or even a stop sign to mm -hmm. say, okay, I've done this. These are the possibilities. This is what scientists are doing, only at more sort of radical levels for us in our consumption and eating of the other. Um, so we need to call attention to mm -hmm. this space. And uh, there, there are artists on both sides, as you know, of that, mm, of sure. that real question. And it's, I think it's hugely hotly debated and uh, absolute ethical concern. Mm -hmm. But I, I've, you know, I'm talking to a variety of scientists about this because I've worked with, with a sort of cattle issues of cattle breeding mm -hmm. over the last 200 years, as you know. And um, they're, they aren't concerned um, that I see um, about the uh, breeding uh, of these animals in terms of what happens to uh, the, uh, the gen loss of particular breeds or the mm -hmm. extinction of a, of a particular rare longhorn breed, etc. Uh, instead, it's really uh, about how can we uh, make them more efficient and marketable for mm -hmm. what we need, uh, given, well, issues of drought, issues of, of, of what they're eating, et cetera. So how can we make their, their genes more perfectible towards our issues of mass consumption, mm -hmm. which you alluded to mm -hmm. before? And um, I do think there, are, there, there should be a space for the animal world that is clearly uh, other than or outside the being of beings. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's unreachable by the, the shepherd's hook. Mm -hmm. Well, there are attempts to have reservoirs set up um, and places set aside. Uh, but as population explodes and as climate change happens, you begin to wonder how effective these will be in the long run. Uh, What's puzzling is that we have come to a point within our technological way of being that we use technology to solve technological problems. So if there's a problem, technological problem, there must be then a technological solution. Mm -hmm. So it propagates itself mm -hmm. and defers it to a particular future, mm -hmm. right? Um, we'll solve that later mm -hmm. with a new technology, rather than uh, reimagining the question altogether. Exactly. Right? It could be that it is, uh as Heidegger also said, at the, at the bottom of the question of technology is not a technological question. That's right. Um, of course, it raises the question of what question there is there. And it reminds me of the Uxkul um, story of the tick who can rate. This is one of my favorite stories uh, of anything. <laughs> it's a, it's great just, story. a fantastic, amazing story where the tick can wait for up to 18 years on the end of a branch waiting for its prey to come by, and a combination of skin, temperature, a lot of factors will intervene into that, but it can wait. And so I have the quote here from um, uh, Agamben uh, about that, and he says, and this, this is, to me, this is uh, very apropos of the era that we're entering, or the kind of period of waiting, both, as Derrida would say, a messianic without Messiah waiting. Right. But he says, what becomes of the tick and its world in this state of suspension that lasts 18 years. How is it possible for a living being that consists entirely in its relationship with the environment to survive an absolute deprivation of that environment? And what sense does it make of waiting without time and without world? And it seems like we're entering a kind of a technological era of, in that sense where we are evacuating the world, creating a kind of a void at the center of everything. Um, that we appear to be waiting for something, you know, and who knows what will happen at the end of that 18-year period, so to speak, when something triggers the uh, human, uh, it could be, uh, I, I don't know, you know, but uh, Agamben's discourse often centers on that kind of mystical moment of uh, waiting and redemption, if you want to put it in right. sort of those quasi-theological terms. No, that's right. And, you know, I mean, you've alluded to uh, to Derrida's uh, Spectres and Marx, um, and the issue of the to come mm -hmm. and uh, this idea of a to come that isn't along the trajectory of the current future, mm -hmm. um, isn't digestible. Um, or this is uh, similar for me, I think, um, although I, perhaps some would quibble with this, but similar for me is 
uh, Deleuze's notion of the virtual, um, which isn't uh, currently within, within the real, and uh, there are certain possibilities that can extend out in time given mm -hmm. where we are today. Mm -hmm. But the virtual is that which is outside those possibilities, yet lingers there as, as with the to come, that which, which haunts us, mm -hmm. which haunts, which is a scar upon the real towards something different. And um, I think the animals perhaps um, offer us, that I alluded to earlier, uh, the animal revolution. They offer this possibility of sacrifice, not for our consumption or our capitalist ends, but towards some other Toward some other, they allow the opportunity for thought, mm. right? not towards uh, production, towards new technologies, as you were saying with, mm -hmm. with the Heidegger qu question mm -hmm. concerning technology, but instead, uh, as, as Heidegger says, the, the technological question is not that of being, uh, or is not that of, of, of technology, but it's a being. It's a thinking outside of the technological. And perhaps the animal calls us into this thinking and this questioning once mm. again. Right? And perhaps finally enables us to get a clear idea of what it means to eat well, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, pleasure.